E.T. here. This video is the first of many discussing old-time fighters who would, in my opinion, stand up to today's top-class boxers. Despite contemporary athletes' less rigorous schedule of bouts, better conditioning, improved ring skills, and, most importantly, use of performance-enhancing drugs. Now, E.T., whenever examining athletes, bodybuilders, or whoever, draws a line at 1960. That's when Dianabol, the first anabolic to go public in a big way, changed everything. This is not meant to imply that any post-1960 fighter matched in these videos has taken any illegal substance. As a personal footnote, ET favors legalization of anabolic because whatever, if any, increase in punching power would, in my opinion, be offset by muscular strength in the neck and trapezius, thus adding protection to the brain. The old-time fighters that I'll be talking about in subsequent videos lack the above-mentioned advantages, but they would nonetheless stand a good chance of making the top tier among fighters today, meaning since 1960, in their respective weight classes, assuming that each fighter was at the top of his game. This is Harry Gribb, also known as the Pittsburgh Windmill. He fought almost 300 bouts during a 13-year career. He fought welterweight and light heavyweight, sometimes against boxers in the heavy heavyweight class. Uh, he did so with sight in only one eye. Greb was American light heavyweight champion between, I think it was 1922 and 23, and he was world middleweight champion between 1923 and 1926. He handed the great light heavyweight and heavyweight champion Gene Tunney, one of the other greats I'm going to talk about, who took the heavyweight title from Jack Dempsey. He took Tunney to his only defeat ever. Greb suffered only two TKOs in 298 fights. They were very early in his career. One was against a much heavier opponent, and the other after he, Greb, broke his arm. Greb style. He'd swarm an opponent with punches, then pull away, jump in again. He relied on expert footwork and not any explosive KO power. Greb could turn an opponent to his advantage, and on occasion do dirty work with his glove laces and his, his uh, heel of his hand. So how would Greb fare against, say, a great middleweight like, well, let's pick Marvin Hagler. Marvin Hagler stood 5 feet 9.5 inches. That's about 177 centimeters. He had a 75-inch reach, about 190, 91 centimeters. And at his best during the mid-1980s, say 1985, when he knocked out Tommy Hearns, the first round of that bout, by the way, is believed by some to be, and believed by E.T. too, to be the greatest round ever fought. By that time, Hagler had fought 65 of his 67 pro bouts, and he had lost only three uh, the last he would lose to Ray Leonard, which, in my opinion, uh, was a fight that Hagler won. And he lost two in 1976. That's very early in Hagler's career. And against relative unknowns, Willie Monroe and Bobby Watts. Hagler was never knocked out. Hagler's style was, like Greb, to move forward always, never give an inch, swarm an opponent. His knockout power was impressive at 78%. One example being the third round knockout of Tommy Hearns. Harry Greb stood a little bit shorter at 5 feet 8 inches, about 172, 73 centimeters. Greb's reach about 71 inches, 180 centimeters. Many factors determine when a fighter was at his prime. In other words, at his absolute best. We include age, experience, ring wear, overall health. So E.T. took each fighter's defining fight to determine 
when each was at his best. Heckler's bout with Tommy Hearns took place in April of 1985. Heckler was 31 and in top shape. He had fought 64 times as a pro against very serious opposition, but none approached the caliber faced by Harry Greb. So, some previous ring damage on Hearns, but plenty of experience. Hagler knocked out Tommy Hearns in round number three. E.T. picked for Greb his first fight with light heavyweight Gene Tunney. Tunney is one of those that E.T. believes could hold his own with any light heavyweight in the contemporary era. But Greb handed Tunney, who outweighed Greb by 12 to 15 pounds, Tunney's only professional defeat, uh, one that Tunney avenged later. Harry Greb was age 28 in 1922 when he first met Tunney, and he had had, Greb had, 217 fights, victories against top fighters of the day, including heavyweights and light heavyweights when Greb was, was fighting as a middleweight. Uh, several of those were against ex or future world champions. I didn't even mention the many bare knuckle fights in bar tussles and the sparring sessions, some with heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey. The reports came out that Greb roughed up Dempsey pretty bad. So Greb, when he meets in this fictional bout with Marvin Hagler, has quite a bit of ring damage as well as experience. In fact, Harry Greb is blind in one eye. Neither fighter has a serious physical advantage, although Hagler has a tiny edge in reach and height. Greb has only two knockout losses. They came, as I mentioned, very early in his career. In fact, one, he was in his teens, and uh, the other was against a much heavier fighter. Both fighters had unbelievable stamina, able to last many rounds. Well, let's take a look at this fictional fight as E.T. sees it. It would probably have Greb in the first round swarming Hagler, who tended to pace himself in the early rounds. But this is going to force Hagler into a clinch, and both opponents never back up, so there are going to be quite a few clinches. Now, keep in mind that the two bouts for each already mentioned, Hagler versus Hearns, uh, Greb versus Tunney, both considered great fights, were slugger against boxer types. They make for really great battles. Here, we have two sluggers meeting each other. Hagler, already experienced with sluggers like Roberto Duran and, and Vito Antofomero, has never grappled with somebody as strong as Greb, who has fought and beat many champions, many ex-champions, and soon-to-be champions. And many of them weigh as much as 35 pounds more than Greb. So, Marvin will find himself either backing up, which Marvin Hagler doesn't do, or clinching, as Greb's relentless punches swarm on him like locust against his face, kidneys, and liver. Though Hagler realizes Greb's punches lack the power of those of, say, Tommy Hearns. By mid-fight, about round five, Hagler realizes that Greb is more of a threat than Entro Fermo, with whom he earned a draw in their first fight in 1981, and he, Hagler, may well lose big on the scorecards. So Hagler steps up the pace. He will back away to create more space to counter Greb's windmill style and land a knockout punch, but few of them hit the mark, and none of them slow down Greb, whose footwork allows him to dance around Hagler, move in and out, landing while avoiding the punches. Round number 10 will be seen as one of the greatest in middleweight history, because both men are going at it nose to nose, absorbing and throwing punches, at the final bell, both are bloodied and exhausted. They hug and congratulate each other for the warriors that they are. The judges and referee decide in favor of Harry Greb. It's unanimous, but it's a close decision. That is how E.T. sees it, but we'll never know for sure. What do you think?
type in your thoughts in the comment section below. And while you're at it, you see the little thumbs up button, the like button, hit that. That encourages the lords of YouTube to make more of these videos available. And that bell icon, if you touch that, you'll be notified when new videos appear. This is E.T. Thank you for watching.